Please be advised that the content of this conversation is sensitive. It may also be triggering for some. If you or anyone that you know is a rape victim survivor, please do not hesitate to contact any one of the helplines that we have just listed. Consent on a very simple and basic level is someone agreeing, so basically saying yes to something um, and giving the go-ahead for something to happen. Quick example, for instance, when you allow F&B or a bank to get a transaction in your account when you need a debit order or whatever, so you have to give a consent to say that you are able to take money from my account. Right, so that's just a very basic and simple example for consent. However, we're speaking about it on a more sensitive, on a more sensitive basis with regards to rape and rape culture. So consent in the context of rape is verbal or non-verbal communication expressing the desire to engage in sexual activity. I just quickly want to provide a working definition um, by Professor Pumla um, Gola, and she defines rape as a communication of patriarchal power, reigning in, enforcing submission, and punishing defiance. It is an extreme act of aggression and of power, always gendered and enacted against the feminine. The feminine may not always be embodied in a way of a woman's body, but however, it is always gendered and enacted against the feminine, right? Um, so, bodies we consider as sexually marginalized, including the LGBTQ plus community, um, non-gender um, binary people, um, people who identify as queer. So rape culture, according to my understanding, is um, a network or system um, that is entrenched in patriarchy and normalizes rape rights. So um, we have, for instance, in South Africa, these really high um, levels of rape and sexual violence and gender-based violence generally because something enables the prevalence of rape rights, and that something is rape culture. Um, and there are different tenets or elements um, in rape culture, including how the legal system continually betrays um, victims of of sexual violence, um, just generally our social perceptions, um, also also rape myths. So for instance, this idea or this, these narratives, right, that women should be, or women should behave in a certain way, women should be um, cognizant of their movements and choices, be it choices in terms of dress code, be it just thinking about um, whether or not you want to go out at night, just basically the policing of black women's movements or the policing of how we dress, right? Um, so I want to talk about how rape myths in particular sustain rape culture, mm -hmm. which then obviously enables rape to continually happen or, in, or normalizes rape generally in our society. And just to extend on that, right, which for me is something that I've always sort of was concerned about and intrigued about this logic of shame. So I've, I've understood mm -hmm. the logic of shame is something that as a woman, you aren't able to like know how your vagina even looks like from yeah. that basis to not wanting to wear a short skirt or not wanting to wear pants even at church or whatever the case is. So like you constantly have this sort of hovering sense of policing. Right, and it's primarily because I mean, even going to the beach is such a crisis because like you find people wearing like you find women like being dressed in black and just like yes. how are you gonna get to the beach with the blankets? Exactly. But because of how pervasive patriarchy is and how it enables that, and it makes and it normalizes it, right? It exactly. makes it okay to you know feel like it's important for you to cover up. Mm. And I think for me, it even boils down to it being particular bodies that yes. are policed yes. in particular kinds of ways, yes. right? I mean, I think on a general basis, bodies are policed, but there's like this particular body yes. as a black woman, yes. which is like policed to, I don't know, like, please extend on that. Like, yes, um, thank you so much for that. I'm smiling because in my mind, I'm just like, these are the kinds of conversations that we're always wanting to have. They are necessary to have. Um, and when you're thinking about the aspect of race in the phenomenon of rape, mm -hmm. right, it's very important to think about the social constructions of the bodies that are involved in that particular, not even just the moment, but that struggle of having been violated. Um, there is a myth, right? Not even a myth, there are a number of myths that are related to race and rape. Yeah. I think I'm just going to 
in no particular order, right? Because we're not chronological thinkers here, things just happen. In no particular order, I'm going to speak about the myth that only black men can rape, right? Mm -hmm. Firstly, that is a very racist project. It's an incredibly racist project. Um, and there have been a number of people like Gola and even um, Helen Moffat who have made the argument that the only reason why you're seeing high rates of rape among black people is because the majority of our population is black, yes. right? Um, but any man can rape, and in, in, in actual fact, any man does rape, right? Um, but then there's a more insidious reason for, for attributing rape to a particular kind of race, right? It is the racist project. But also, there's also a racist and a sexist project, so it's a very intersectional project that comes into play when a black woman is a victim survivor of rape, right? And even people, again, Kunda Kola is such an important person to read because she then unpacks this issue of the pornography of empire, mm -hmm. where she's speaking about the empire as a particular historical phenomenon, and that phenomenon is that of slavery, mm -hmm. and how slave, slavery and slave narratives have worked to specifically construct black women's bodies as, as hypersexual. And in constructing the black woman's body as hypersexual, it's to say that that black woman's body is unrapeable. Mm -hmm. because it's made available to anyone and in, at any time, right? Specifically to the white person. So then when you think about that particular dynamic, it becomes quite silly, actually, to say that only black men rape. Yeah. Not when we've got a history of slavery. Yeah. Not when we have colored folk at all, mixed race folk, that are a product of that specific sexual violation. So it's, it's actually such a mediocre reasoning to say that only black people rape. But I think also very importantly is to, to think about the kinds of meanings that are assigned to black women's bodies and white women's bodies. So black women's bodies, as mentioned, are very hypersexual, as white women's bodies, or white femininity, rather, I think. I think it's important to think about white femininity and how it's curated, is that it's marked as innocent right, yeah. and is pure. And I think Gorilla has something, you know, I, we were speaking about this before we were actually shooting, and I think it's such an important aspect to raise, just that binary positioning mm -hmm. of black femininity and white femininity and how those social constructions are read when both people or, or both types of women are, are victim survivors of rape. You know, it is read differently. The public outcry is different and the consequences are different. So, you know what I Yeah. I think it's so important to then just go back, right, and sort of um, unpack or deconstruct different notions and constructions of womanhood, right? Mm -hmm. So what constitutes a woman, right? So again, Mali gave us um, this amazing narrative and history taking us back to slavery. So then we see um, the difference between an object. An object is a thing that has obviously no sense of urgency, or oh, urgency, no sense of agency rather, um, and a subject, right? And white women have always been defined as these people who, although, I mean, granted, they are patriarchal men and white, white women do suffer from patriarchy, but I mean, the degrees are not the same, right? So from that basis, when we differentiate between white womanhood and black womanhood, we see that slavery has created the system of, of dehumanization, um, object, objectification of black women in particular, right? That does not extend to white constructions of womanhood. So like you said, um, white women are constructed as pure, um, constructed as as these clean people, whereas black women are dirty and greedy and hypersexual, and all they want is... Can I use crude language? Of course. It's a crude conversation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is a very difficult conversation. So. And they can't get enough of the penis. Right. Yeah. Whereas, whereas white women have self control, yeah. um, and because and and, and again, it's the, this framing of the black body being unrapeable. Because a, how do you rape an object? But b, how do you rape someone who is always wanting to have sex? Right. Yeah, so in excess. Exactly. So so even even the conversation of consent doesn't apply because I can't get enough of. Yeah. And also, I think also just to bring it back to our current context to say. Even so, the product of slavery, colonialism, and apartheid enable the systems of justice to like deal with the black woman in ways that are completely different to how, for instance, if um, a victim of a different race or a gender would come to you know a police service to say, actually, as woman, as black as a black woman, I have been accused of what not what not. You're always like encountering sort of attacks of. What were you wearing? Yes. Mm. What were you doing at this time? 
Um, yes. Yes. And it's like it's a lot of cultural codes of rape yeah. are very, very yeah. important to speak about. And the grand narrative is always asking for it. Yes. So, so then again, going back to the idea or the concept of consent, how do I consent to something when I'm always framed as asking for it, right? Or to be like to get in in your so she asked for it. On my was out at night at 12 a.m. alone, she asked for it. Mm. So there's this they always Exactly. So, so, so black women are always positioned as people who ask to be violated. You know, as you're saying that, I'm actually thinking about something that's even more painful about the rape myth and the question of black women. is to say that when you're a black woman, we're getting to a point and it's quite, it's very, very, for me, it's very uncomfortable. It makes me feel incredibly unsafe, is that people are no longer even asking you what you're wearing. Mm -hmm. Because I could have been wearing pants, but because I'm a black woman, I deserved it. Exactly. It doesn't matter yeah. anymore. It's at that point. It, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. And you see with how the world and the society that we live in is even protecting people like R. Kelly. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Those were little girls, underage girls. Mm -hmm. It does not matter. A little girl cannot be asked what she was wearing. It doesn't matter. It's a child. A little girl can't be asked whether or not she was drinking or whether or not she was out at night. It doesn't matter. That's how disposable the black woman's body is. It's so painful because like just, I think a day ago I was on Twitter and it's so horrific that, so these two guys have convinced themselves that it's okay to rape a toddler. Yeah. What? And it was so gruesome and so like, oh, you can talk about this a lot. But like, because like their genitals were so large, they couldn't. They decided to cut the kid. Like, like, I'm just like, where are we? Where are we as a nation? And I want to like bring forth this. There's a, an exhibition that's come forth. It's, I'll I'll put up the the artist's name at the end of this conversation because I think it's so important. So it's an art exhibition of clothes that victims were wearing, and they have like jeans, like a dress, nappies mm. to sort of illustrate wow. to illustrate that. What I'm wearing has wow. absolutely nothing. nothing. But the, it's a lack of self-control and lack of self-respect and dignity for other people mm -hmm. that perpetrators have. Mm -hmm. And you see, just on that issue of dignity and integrity, I think I would like to move this conversation to speak about um, something else that's been on my mind. It's just the integrity of the lawyers who defend the rapists. Mm -hmm. My biggest issue with, I won't even call it the justice system, it's the legal system because the legal system has no firm grip of what justice is. So it's the legal system. Yeah. It's for me, the integrity that you have as a lawyer and your street cred to me is incredibly, incredibly questionable. Mm -hmm. As someone who would even dare to take on a, a, a rape case where your client is the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And you will go out of your way to defame and to criminalize completely the, the victim survivor's narrative and their account of what happened. Yeah. Um, and I, here I just want to move into the conversation of thinking about um, specific rape trials. So when we think about in the South African context, there have been many, even when in Zimbabwe. But I think the one that, that, that stands up, out for us even even more, um, because it was such a grand public figure that, that still is associated with the National Party, is the Jacob Zuma and the Kwezi rape trial. Yeah. Right, and then in other contexts, so when you think about transnational patriarchy, how what happened here with the Jacob Zuma rape trial is exactly how the the the, the, the trial of RKD unfolded in America, mm -hmm. and in that way you're starting to see that we have a much bigger problem. It's not on a on, on the scale of a microscopic scale. Yeah. It's it's macro in scope. It's big. It's bigger than than you just being in a specific time space. Rape does not have a time space jurisdiction. It does it has no regard. And when I'm thinking about the integrity of the of, of, of the legal system, I always ask myself that the legal system refers to the social constructions of rape, right? Mm -hmm. When they are try, trying anyone for rape. So they refer to they they use the rape model of rape myths. Yeah. Right? So the line of questioning even of the lawyers how many sexual partners have you had? Exactly. What is the status of your HIV? What is your HIV status? I mean, Ufa Zega Kuzwayo, the late Ufa Zega Kuzwayo, who, the woman that we know, that we knew as Ukwezi, was asked those questions, mm -hmm. right? What is, the, what is your HIV? I mean, what, what does that have to do with anything? Mm -hmm. But they failed to then consider how those very social constructions that they are working in 
are the same constructions that they have to actually work against mm -hmm. when they are trying those people. Mm -hmm. With the RKD rape case, my biggest concern was, yes, the lawyers, but also, and the, and the question of integrity, but also the question of this evidence-based kind of logic mm -hmm. that really, it, 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 it frustrates me. Mm -hmm. RKD was found in position, in position of a number of sex tapes, yeah. right? So he was creating, he was the producer and the content creator of child pornography. Yet when he got acquitted in 2008, it was on the grounds that that child that was in that video could not be identified. Mm -hmm. Here again, the question of integrity comes in. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of whether or not you could put a name and an address and whatever else, that action has been done. It's been done. Like, and you can see in and of yourself, that is a child. Mm -hmm. That is a child. So the very integrity, not even just of the lawyers, but the justice system is one that is predicated upon a heteronormative, heteropatriarchal society. Mm -hmm. The justice system or the legal system and rather, racist. is and the racist system. <laughs> And the racist system because we, 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 we can't negate the fact that what just spoke about now is that those girls were not just any, any girl. It wasn't just any kind mm -hmm. of girl. Mm -hmm. There was a black girl. Mm -hmm. And also, like, it's about power and position, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because, and I like how we're doing this transnational patriarchy sort of um, thinking in ways of like interrogating what we're dealing with currently because, I mean, quite recently we've had in the Fismas Fall movement, we've had the army reference list. Yes. And although that was primarily based at Rhodes University, but like you have like all these women coming up and saying, oh, but this ex-political leader came mm -hmm. and was like on some, you know. And it's interesting because those questions of how many sexual partners yes. doesn't happen when yes. like that particular perpetrator is asked, right? Yeah. Or come into question or is accused, right? Those questions are coming. And I think that those questions are important because firstly, you'll find that a perpetrator does not have a single victim. It is very seldom. Mm -hmm. yes. That's according to true. how people who are yes. working hard and doing sort of rape and like trying to understand, time. Yeah, trying to understand. Time. Mm -hmm. you never have a single perpetrator mm -hmm. that has one victim. You mm -hmm. seldom have uh, what's this thing, and it's often within the same circles, mm -hmm. right? And you're thinking about how political parties function in this country, right? You have it's you often know, like it's regional, it's very uh, like parochial in the sense of you know the people in this particular zone, right? Mm. And you know that like this ex leader is with certain people, mm. right? You know, like it's 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 an open secret, yes, yeah. and it's a specific kind of person, and that for me, it's I mean I mean the the pool of victims that the perpetrator perpetrator chooses from occupy a very particular part of our society. They are positioned in very specific ways. Mm -hmm. And this, I always say there's always something about the black woman that is disposable. Yeah. Oh, yes. And again, it, then we go into the language of the victim survivor. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason that makes it so difficult to come out as a victim survivor of rape as a black woman is because you, your, your, your position in life, what you're destined to be is to be vulnerable and accessible. That vulnerability literally steals the vocabulary from your body to ever say anything. Mm. Because you must remember, there's something about your gender, right? So being a woman and being a black woman, that necessarily dictates to you how you move in space and time. Yeah. What you can say, and what you even want to find the words to be able to say. You know, the things that you're just like, I don't want to talk about this, because it, it has the possibility of fracturing a specific kind of community, mm. which then speaks to how Black people actually don't give a fuck. They don't. They don't give a fuck. Like, they don't give a fuck about what happens to black women, to black girls, to black queer boys that are growing up in our neighborhoods, to black queer men, they don't give a fuck. For as long as their community remains intact, whatever happens to you is necessary. So then, then that means that the black community in and of itself is invested in networks of silence, mm. right? Because the minute you speak up, you receive a yes. backlash. And again, it goes to the, to the construction of black womanhood, right? Mm. A, so I read an article recently about how um, young children, young veterans obviously, can't be children. So, so from a very young age, you are seen as an adult. And this is prevalent, right, in black communities. So, so already when you are five, six, ten, I mean by twelve you are a grown woman. Mm. So, so already when, when we are so quick to, so it's called identification where, where it's a process of making a child an adult. And, and at that instance you sexually 
objectify the child and as soon as a child speaks up you receive this backlash because how dare you speak up how dare you risk mm -hmm. us being a fragmented so black community like you said right um and i want to get to then talk about how a black man is literally this guardian of the black community and wants to attack the black community because i mean in all honesty when we speak against rapists we speak against black men and when we speak up against black men inevitably we apparently speak against the black community. black community. But I mean, as a real community, if, if we don't pull through for our black girls. And again, it goes back to how disposable black women bodies are. Like, we just don't matter. Mm. No, it's true. And thanks for the opportunity to sort of extend on the conversation about how essentialist our thinking is, right, as the black community. Because we're just, like, and I think it stems from this very, like, you know, essentialist, like, kumbaya, you know, things of in the past, like, you know, the black woman. Yes. And it's about these tropes, right? So yeah. the black woman is a trope, like, troped as the land, for instance, right? Like, Mama mm -hmm. Africa, right? You're also troped. So if, if you're not, like, Mother Mother Earth and whatnot, the virgin soil, and, virgin soil yes. and all of those things, right? And it also speaks of, about conquering, mm -hmm. right? So, so you conquer you conquer a woman's body, you conquer land, mm -hmm. right? It's, and it's... Uh, for me, it's how universal patriarchy is. So yes. black men can come and say, "Oh no, but patriarchy came with white men." No, actually, you partnered up with them. Yes. So yes. Kill us. Yes. yes, that's what's happening. We came here to die. Yeah, yes. you're like literally, you're here to like end us. Mm. And but also, we're witches, so we're coming for you. Just saying. I mean, <laughs> just saying. But like, for me, it speaks about how, as a black woman, if you are gonna say, "Oh man, who may like mama, oh like yeah. to deal in some yes. kind of ways." It's not about, and even with queer bodies, like I was talking to a friend of mine quite recently about how queer bodies are a spectacle back home in December for mm -hmm. family gatherings yes. because of how Umadum is still around. Mm -hmm. exactly. But like, we're not welcome as a queer body in your yeah. own home, mm -hmm. in your own family. So, how then do we think about family and units of like community if, you know, there's still sort mm -hmm. of things of exclusion and, right, other bodies are like, at the periphery of this family. Exactly. Yeah, going back, can I just jump in? Yes, you can. Go, going oh. back to um, Jacob Zuma trial, right, and Ofez. Literally, everyone came out there saying Ofez is part of some spy group or conspiracy oh, group um, trying to just break down Jacob Zuma because Jacob Zuma was obviously in the running of becoming the president. So it's always this positioning of black women wanting to destroy. And no one ever thinks about how black men destroy black women. It's yes. always the other way around, right? How, how black women are committed to this project of destroying black men. And it's just so weird because in that situation, you are the one who's violated. But no one ever takes your, your sexual violation in account because, I mean, mm. if you're a black woman, you are disposable, like we keep saying. Oh. And sorry, I tell you because I know that this is more kind of scholarship girl, and I really uh, what would like for you to to chip in. Um, you spoke about how the family is imagined, right? And I think it's important to think about how the family is mediated through the language of music, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how music, also in South Africa, is such an important aspect of even our struggle. Mm -hmm. um, so. When I'm thinking about how the, the, the black family in particular is mediated through the language of music and how notions of, of unity and of nation would come about through music, mm -hmm. I'm also then, in the first part, I'm thinking about J the Jacob Zuma rape trial, where outside of the courtroom you had a number of even black women that were singing Um Shinwan, oh, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we all know the Um Shinwan belongs to a very, very specific kind of figure, and that is who we call Ubaba. Baba of the nation. I mean, that's what we call who. Baba got to do that. Baba got to do that. Baba one. That's what we're actually saying. Baba wait. Because that's a cultural code for being able to say that's also my father. Mm -hmm. You know, by giving him that that kind of name, you identify with him as being the custodian. Mm -hmm. And even by memorializing him when a, a woman has been violated by singing a song that is so close to Umshinwan, you are actually also memorializing what he did to that to that woman. Umshinwan mm -hmm. is such it is such a violent. It's a weapon. Mm, it's a yeah. weapon of destruction. In which case, that was Jacob Zuma's penis. Yeah. That it's, it's such a phallic kind of song to be singing, and it's and even transnationally, then when we're thinking about people like R. Kelly, he curates the same kind of feeling, yeah. or, the, or the same he dictates to you, or he scripts, right? Or he reminds us of the script 
that is involved in making the black family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so even when we think about who, 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 who R. Kelly, his notion of, of the family mm -hmm. is centered around, so step in the name of love. Happy but then yeah. he goes and he writes and he produces shit like Asian, nothing but a number for a 15 year old girl. So you're sitting there and you're like, I don't know what's happening. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot that's happening here. You know, Mali, and I think this is why I'm so intrigued by how nuance functions, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. in how affect works, yes. Yes. right? And this is also another field of scholarship of yours, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm still thinking about it as from as using music as my literary base, mm -hmm. right? As coming from a, from a literature sort of scholarship and thinking about what sound does, mm -hmm. right? So as you've mentioned, Zuma's using sort of the phallic symbol of Ushinwan, mm -hmm. right? As, you know, a mode of sort of, and what music does to you when you're listening to yes. it, right? Because yeah. they about also the, the the strategically, when R. Kelly releases the music like R. K like Happy People, mm -hmm. Step in the Name of Love, those are and it's mentioned even in the documentary, right? When so he's using he's releasing this music and people are creating memories mm -hmm. of, As a family. of 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 family yeah. gatherings mm -hmm. of graduations of graduations mm -hmm. of weddings, right? Mm -hmm. And those are very like pinnacle moments mm -hmm. of, of 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 black familyhood. I mean, even historically in South Africa getting married, going to graduation, mm. those are important, like, they are so, like, even currently, being the first graduate in your family is yes. a big deal. Yeah. That first graduation isn't yours, it's for the family, yeah. because of how, sort of, how whiteness, white supremacy functions, how cultural codes function in terms of, you know, capitalism and social mobility, what that means for your family, what that means, you know, for you as a black person coming from, you know, a particular socioeconomic group. Yeah. Right. So it's so it's a it's it's quite menial how a song contributes to a larger narrative of how we're thinking about that. Yeah. And for me, I'm also coming from it in a sense of how romantic misery mm -hmm. is a part of our um, you know love language. Mm -hmm. So R and B. Yes. R Kelly was known as you know the king of R and B yeah. at some point, and how then. And I'm, uh, from here, I'm speaking to black women in particular, and it's not necessarily an attack, but it's a question to say, how are we creating, how are we cur curating, sorry guys, it's still with Jesus, <laughs> how are we curating our, our sort of um, Cinderella's, our Snow White's, mm. our, our love, mm. who are our princes, mm. right? Because even now, R. Kelly sold out in Chicago shortly after Surviving R. Kelly came out. He sold out, and it was black women that were like, Time here, you know, and you're just like, wait, wait, like, and I know, like, a question of solidarity is gonna come, like, yeah, much later in our conversation. one of those episodes. It's gonna come up, but for me, I'm thinking about how we invest in how our desire function in terms of how we're thinking about what our love language is. Mm. What does love look like mm. for a black woman? What, like, what does it look like? And even RB as a genre of music has got men who are like apologizing, like, mm. they are not cheating on you, yo. But I'm like, on you. Yes. But like, Asha, all of this, like, the kind of, it's like, oh my god, it's actually it's so lot. depressing. It, is it really is. You find men like apologizing to you for cheating on you, and they're just like, but I love you. And like, that, that and kind of, it's supposed to pull you in. Because exactly. they've already created that image of the family, right? Yeah. It's this idea that even if I mess up, I can fuck up as many times yeah. as like as you know as possible. But the important thing is that as black folk we gotta stay together, irrespective yeah. of the pain that you're going through or whatever. And I think um we we we've, we've done a lot. We've done we've done a lot of talking and I think the over art art arching what's it? That's yeah, wow, arching wow, arching. Arching. <laughs> The overarching oh, argument has definitely been the question of language. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've highlighted the uses of language when we're perpetuating rape and rape culture. And how we think about it. Um, how we think about it, how we speak about it, how we respond mm -hmm. to it, and the kinds of vocabularies that we employ um, when we're even just conversing about it. Um, I think that was a, a very good kind of point of entry into... Very powerful. Uh, yes. Very powerful. Um, productive. Um, so, yeah, um, please be reminded again to reach out. If this conversation has been triggering to you in any way, shape, or form, please do also comment in the box below. Um, <laughs> please comment on the box below if you have any questions, comments, or things that you, th you feel that you would like us to expand on. 
um, and we will see what we do in the following episodes. Um, yeah, we already have like conversations, but eh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always room for like pop up conversations, guys. We're very open to that kind of thing. We're very committed to the project um, of disempowering these violent uh, conventions and empowering what seems to us like a healthy um, environment, particularly for black women. So we're invested in creating that kind of thinking space, that kind of space for being. And start with conversing. And right? so, yes, yes. So. And just thinking through our lived experiences, thinking through society, thinking mm. through working, normalization of sexual violence, normalization of constructions of violence and toxic masculinities, and all of that. And just unpacking, obviously, the hope of dismantling. Yeah. Mm. I'd like to say thank you, guys. Thank you for this opportunity. Like, I'm feeling very, like, I'm feeling a sense of gratitude for yeah. because it's the beginning. It is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys so thank much. Thank you. See you guys in our next Bye. video. Bye. Bye.